So, Lori Furstenberg is just so cool. Let's just, let's just start with that, okay? I've known Lori for a long time. She went to Berkeley. She got her PhD at Harvard. We don't get much of that down here. Um, she was a curator at Artist Space. Uh, she was at Mac for a while. Um, in 2005, she started LAX, and uh, she curated the California Biennial. Um, and she's always remained on the vanguard of what's going on in contemporary art. She's worked with artists that I adore, like Waleed Beshti, Daniel J. Martinez, Mark Bradford, Ruben Ochoa, Corey Newkirk, you might see a few locust artists that have drifted in through here. And, and she's done, I think you're up to about 150 projects now in the, in the eight years. Okay, my bad. She's close to 200 projects in the last eight years. Um, when, uh, when we get stuck sometimes at Locust, uh, we ask ourselves, WWLD, what would Lori do? Um, and so uh, one of the other reasons I like her a lot is because she loves NWA and Public Enemy, so, uh, so we have that in common. Um, I think you're in for a real treat tonight. I, uh, she's a very, very special curator, really on the cutting edge. Oh, and her other claim to fame is she gave uh, our own Diana Nowy uh, her first gig. So thank goodness for that. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. So, so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lori Furstenberg. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Locus, for hosting me, and to the Shoals, who have been so generous, and for that over-glorified introduction, and also to all of the artists who are so generous with Edie and I the past two days. It's uh, very lovely of you. So it's interesting to talk about LAX art today. Is there feedback? Is it reverberating a little? Um, because every time I'm asked to speak about the organization, it's happening at a different moment in time and from a different point of view. And today, whereas when we started LAX Art in 2005, it was really about rethinking and questioning the viability of the nonprofit model, sort of at large, looking at uh, case studies in every major metropolis and looking at the constellation of arts organizations in Los Angeles and seeing why independent experimental exhibition spaces in the context of LA, which um, had a very strong history like it does in every city, but a very specific history in Los Angeles, um, why it wasn't a kind of sustainable uh, platform. and. Um, and so now that we're kind of reflecting upon where we started in 2005 um, with language and questions around flexibility and really being capricious against kind of institutional fixity, and now we're kind of looking to our 10-year anniversary, and now so many incredible new artist-run spaces and kind of very flexible um, curated driven projects have kind of, you know, uh, been uh, generated out of Los Angeles right now and we're kind of looked to as a kind of mature organization, which is, um, you know, really something uh, to assess. So every year we come together as a community, a kind of sometimes a large group and sometimes smaller groups, usually starting with artist conversations and other people in the community to really digest and hash out in a kind of think tank-like fashion kind of where Los Angeles is and what are the needs of artists at that particular moment. So our intention was always to create a space that could disappear and be renamed and remodeled and regroup and relocated. And every time we come together, the opposite imp of the opposite occurs and that when we have these think tank meetings it usually informs how we behave for the next year 
And so whereas maybe in 2008, uh, when I was afraid to sign another five-year lease, um, and I didn't, and we signed kind of a half of the term of the lease, Artis said, actually, we need space now more than ever, not don't get rid of your space and become an itinerant um, organization. And now, eight years later, what artists are actually requesting and demanding is that we need more space. So the problematic right now is growth and appropriate growth and um, how to keep the ideology of flexibility um, when you are becoming um, maybe an organization big O <laughs> instead of little O and uh, really resisting institutionalization which was always uh, part of the mandate. So that's where we are today. And um, we're kind of entering a kind of new consideration of the question we get every day is what is the renewed vision over the course of the next two years? And really kind of in looking at some of the problems in LA, some of the highly visible, embarrassing uh, institutional fiascos <laughs> coming out of Los Angeles that and a lot of experiments that um, we're coming out of a year. 2012 was about uh, institutional collaboration for us. It just happened that uh, we produced two major projects. One was a festival of performance and public art with the Getty, and then a kind of biennial with the Hammer, um, all six months apart, which was not our desire and it was um, so we're 2013 is recovery mode for LAX art and a reassertion of our independence and kind of dissecting uh, the successes and failures of those collaborations and um, basically what we learned from that is that working with the Getty was incredibly uh, and shockingly productive in that an entity so large kind of coming down onto the ground um, to a space like LAX Art that we were funded and supported and could use the getting machine and not be touched by it programmatically. And so we remained independent. And in the collaboration with the Hammer, what we learned was that when we initially started only with a curatorial programmatic collaboration, where small projects when our curatorial team and their curatorial team came together and said, we have interest in, thank you, hi. Um, when we have um, interest in the same artist, instead of saying to an artist, you can't have a solo show at the Hammer, you can only have it at LAX Art or vice versa, that um, we produce projects concurrently. And um, that collaboration was a dream. And then when the, both entities started touching in a closer collaboration where LAX Art and um, brought to the hammer, this idea that our curatorial team is interested in a larger platform, working on uh, major commissions uh, throughout Los Angeles, and it will be biennialistic, but will not be called a biennial. And they said, we're going to do it together, and it will be an LA biennial, and it will be called the LA biennial. And then it became an entity that is about LA and not international, and it became hammerized, and it, there is going to be a, an LA biennial that they'll move forward with. So that, uh, for us, in terms of our curatorial team and the way artists come to us and the way in which they want to work with us is quite different. And so when we touch that institution, we're no longer able to give artists and our curators that type of freedom. So that failed experiment really brought us back to where we are today, which is about kind of reasserting um, our desire for uh, sustaining an organization that um, can support artistic and curatorial freedom. And now it's a tagline. So um, I wanted to kind of read something that I wrote at the time of uh, when we founded LAX Art eight years ago. And it was really about the kinds of projects um, that I was looking at in the context of LA. 
And one of the projects, um, really a kind of precursor for LAX art, so this is the facade, if some of you who don't know, um, the facade of the building is a platform for programming as well. So this is Sonia Kontorovsky, a site-specific painting. And the facade is used um, for temporary uh, public installations. And the space is quite modest. It's an 800 square foot gallery and a kind of 400 square foot project space. So we use the space as a hub for activity. And uh, it's really a gathering space. But um, we really work um, in experimental sites throughout the city. Uh, the precursor for our space uh, is an uh, artist-run space called Deep River, uh, which was sited downtown between 1997 and 2002. And it was started by Daniel Joseph Martinez, Glenn Kino, Tracy Schiffman, and Rolo Castillo. And the reason why LAX Art was interested in Deep River um, as a point of departure was the language. Their mission was really a manifesto and it was pretty um, kind of uh, capricious and political and uh, they were really criticized for it. But part of the logic of uh, founding Deep River was kind of killing it off in five years. And that was what we took up as our model in 2005, that it would be a five-year project and that we would kill it and an artist would rename it and it would kind of start again, which has not happened. But that was the original intention. And what is really interesting is students of mine at USC are now working on the first kind of uh, unearthing of the Deep River Archive in the context of a publication and it will be an exhibition at LAX Art by the time of our 10-year anniversary. So we're kind of uh, looking back and kind of memorializing um, the site uh, and the kind of main influence uh, for why the organization exists. Um, there were other entities um, in 2003, Unjiju, who ended up being at Red Cat and then the New Museum and um, now is running a foundation um, out of the country, um, and Kahinde Wiley before he was Kahinde Wiley. Um, they had a space called Six Months, and it was a very flexible gathering space. It was mainly for artists to do crits on other artists, and it was a performance space and a discussion space. And that also, for me, the kind of temporal nature of these spaces, to me, uh, was incredibly critical, and that was something that we wanted to inherit that logic. And then there was um, a space called uh, the back room, which I'll talk about. But um, Deep River is really interesting because on the, um, on the window, on the door of their space, there was a note that said, no critics allowed. And it really was a provocation. It was uh, not to be taken literally. It was really just about artists having autonomy to create uh, discourse for themselves. And um, so uh, a famous art critic left this note, don't worry, I won't bother you by mentioning your space in all of these um, magazines that I write for. And um, when we started LAX Art, we opened with a Daniel Martinez show, which I'll speak about, and that critic was the first one in the door and wrote a scathing review um, that brought thousands of people in. So it was interesting. But the back room um, is something I haven't thought about in a long time. And some of its values um, is something that is really interesting to kind of reconsider for us at this moment in time. And it was in Culver City. It also was in dialogue with a project called Champion Fine Arts, Drew Heitzler and Justin Beale um, and Flora Wegman had a kind of uh, also a space where they counted down uh, exhibitions, group exhibitions, and then that kind of evolved into the Mandrake, which was a bar um, on La Cienega that also was given over to artists and curators. Um, but the back room was run by Magali Ariola, Kate Fowler, and Renaud Proch, who ended up at ICI at, um, in New York. And it was a temporary space, but it really resisted the commodity impulse while situating itself at the heart of a major commercial sector in Culver City. It was a spontaneous laboratory of artist relics um, put on display and made available for public use. 
um, consisting of presentations of individual artists, archives in the form of objects and video and publications and photography, which spoke to the personality and politics of the particular artist, the project continually expanded and contracted in a growing body of information um, that never intended to become a concrete collection. And within the jumble of artifacts included Wally Beshti's Life Magazine collection from 1968 or Archigram Films, um, Tom Lawson's archive of Real Life Magazine um, produced in New York and Los Angeles um, from the 70s to the 90s. And in this very kind of heavily congested kind of pedestrian and vehicular uh, kind of thoroughfare, um, the back room really was a space of slowness and for art and socializing in a salon-like forum uh, for discussion and contemplation. And again, the back room was really kind of founded on the premise of impermanence and the curators discussed in a relationship to uh, kind of prioritizing dematerialization, liminality and uh, marginality and really focusing on process over uh, projects. And the beauty of the back room really rests in the interest in cultural production as a temporary phenomenon echoed by its own stated intentions to extinguish itself. So again, this kind of reiteration of like uh, an organization or an entity of project um, kind of killing itself. Um, and they also use Deep River um, as a point of departure. And this model was really relatively uh, rare in Los Angeles. Um, and the curators were constantly responding to research and travel and dialogue with artists. And there was an immediacy to their actions um, that countered geography of art production in Los Angeles. And it was proposing that the city itself, that there are no centers and only ideas to be distributed. And discovery and appreciation of the artist's artifacts required a dedication of time on the part of the audience, just akin to an artist studio experience, demanding a degree of active engagement on the part of the viewer. And the back room brought home the notion of cultural enrichment and knowledge that are not produced through the means of commodification. And in the context of LA, the back room was responding to a very specific context and the interest in sidestepping the problems of institutional practice, gallery systems with illusions of permanence. And for us, uh, looking back at that moment in time, before the art world has kind of proliferated in the context of Los Angeles, um, in terms of a growing commercial sector and uh, a kind of growing artists uh, run space uh, kind of series of projects that are dispersed throughout the city, which is very different than Miami. It seems to be these kind of dense <laughs> areas that are kind of more legible and instead of a kind of like ability to kind of disappear in Los Angeles. Um, so this issue of permanence is something that is really um, kind of at the height of uh, our consciousness right now. And um, so right now we're kind of negotiating, prioritizing sustainability and creating an organization that could be handed off to new generation of artists and curators in a way that hasn't happened in LA over a sustained period of time versus the original intentions and kind of desires and impulses. Um, so, you know, the issue of artists demanding a space um, and a bigger space and, you know, certain artists saying, you know, we have groups like this and if there's a thousand people in a performance, um, you know, they're demanding performance space and gathering space and archival space and library space and so, um, we're just trying to figure out how to prioritize programming in a, the way that we have in a dense, dynamic fashion that's really based on uh, newly commissioned work and how you can sustain um, that dense programming while kind of getting into bed with uh, a small building uh, precisely at this scale. This is pretty remarkable. Um, but the way 
that I mentioned that we started was really um, looking at what we had, which was this facade on La Cienega, this major thoroughfare, and this billboard that kind of faced our building. And so Daniel Martinez, um, who was the first exhibition, he kind of set a tone for um, the type of programming that artists seem to kind of speak to and follow for the next five years. And the billboard and um, the facade were poems that Daniel wrote and they basically were kind of a hybrid of um, appropriated text and uh, composed text by the artist with you know, highly historical and political undertones that were decontextualized and abstracted. Um, and this billboard has now become a site uh, for artists who, even though it's sort of a very common uh, situation, and particularly in Los Angeles, I know Locus has a program as well, um, artists seem to still love to uh, experiment with the billboard format. Um, and so these two sites speak to the exhibitions in the space. And so what Daniel did, um, which is a little bit tricky to talk about in light of what just happened in Boston, but he laid this platform of um, asphalt in the space. So we had a kind of tractor come into the space. It's a very raw space. And then he bordered um, this kind of stage uh, with lard. Uh, tons and tons, thousands and thousands of tons of lard, which um, I guess we were put on a list um, for uh, suspicion of kind of making homemade bombs um, before we opened. And so you kind of stood on this platform and looked at these two photographs, one um, from Mexico 68 Olympics and one from Munich 72 Olympics, and he kind of abstracted um, the sites, even though they're very kind of iconic, and uh, removed the figure, and um, really kind of in a minimalist theatrical way where um, your own body is sort of animating um, the spaces. And there was a new video commissioned concurrently, which is really just um, a flip book of the artist's hands of like generic police riots um, and just kind of a mediation on how history repeats itself. And one of his students then soon responded um, to that installation, Ruben Ochoa, who um, has shown here since. And he created a monumental sculpture of a freeway wall and um, not a kind of literal fragment of a freeway wall, but he was, uh, he, it was a theatricalized uh, kind of set, a kind of uh, William Levitt-like send-up to Hollywood. Um, and he had been uh, kind of investigating photographically the cultural divide of the city of Los Angeles um, through the notion of freeway walls. And you walked under this massive installation to kind of realize that the sculpture was a, a sham or a prop. And uh, concurrently, he produced um, this kind of wallpaper um, on a freeway wall um, in Boyle Heights, uh, which was like the first public project on a freeway wall since the LA Olympics. And it really was about camouflage and the relationship between kind of the landscape pushed behind it and what is in front of it. And the, um, the graffiti uh, is actually his piece, so it's uh, kind of bombed within uh, the logic of, of the photograph. And, um, and then it was constantly uh, kind of morphed um, in by graffiti artists, and then um, it kind of became abstracted and took on a new life. And so working on temporary public art projects is really something that uh, from a curatorial point of view, it's more interesting, um, to me at least, to really kind of try to force public art in, um, to Los Angeles, um, which is a city that's very resistant and doesn't really have uh, a tradition of public art and it, that's not um, corporate. And um, we're able to do this through uh, kind of creating temporary public projects. And there are certain sites in Los Angeles and West Hollywood and Culver City um, that were able to do so. So we produced um, a project with Shannon Ebner 
this sculpture, which um, also uh, was concurrent with an exhibition she produced at our space and a project at the Hammer, so that was sort of an example of um, a collaboration. And our site sits on uh, an alley, and so there are a lot of performances uh, and discussions that happen in this alley. Um, and there uh, was a project um, initiated by an, like the first artist I ever met in New York like 25 years ago, Warren Nydick, who somehow moved to Berlin and then got him made his way to Los Angeles and uh, produced a series of um, curatorial projects with artists called Art in the Parking Spaces. And it's sort of an ongoing series of projects. Um, we work with a lot of guest curators. Um, our site is often used for projects or artists who may not have the institutional support that one would imagine um, in the city where they lived and work. Uh, John Oderbridge created this amazing site-specific installation for us and a billboard and a, a public project and the facade of our building. And, um, Something had happened during PST where the Getty gave millions of dollars to all of the institutions all over Southern California. And John was gonna have his first retrospective, I think at the Claremont Museum, and it closed. And then no museum in Los Angeles would take on the exhibition, which is absurdist. So we couldn't take on a retrospective in 800 square feet, but we gave him everything that we had. And in another city, I believe, like a LACMA or a MOCA or a HAMMER, I think that's their role. So again, it seems uh, like there's, at moments like that, there, there seems like still a reason uh, to be. Um, Glenn Kino, um, who also was one of the founders of Deep River, um, and also a Los Angeles artist, uh, came to us with an idea that, um, you know, he was at the Project Gallery, which, you know, had a very incredible moment and, you know, was a rare, um, really a rare program for a commercial gallery or a quasi-commercial gallery. Um, and it dissolved and a lot of the artists uh, really took a long time to figure out how to recover from like that lost moment. And so he turned to um, the field of magic, he said, in order to kind of uh, believe again. And so he started collaborating with magicians and he really inserted himself hard in the world of magic. So he took over the space and uh, did a lot of performances with magicians, which is now turned in, apparently has like changed the field of magic, like not only is you know, his belief is that, uh, you know, he brought magic into the art world and now that the art world has transformed the world of magic. We'll see, but that's the recent claim. But this was a sculpture, a safe, um, that housed secrets of all um, of the collaborators of the project and now there's an artist book kind of mapping the entire process. Our space is really raw and not museological and um, no natural light. And so painting is a problem in our space. And Kamruza Ram, who's an artist who I've worked with for decades in New York, uh, produced a series of site-specific paintings and he tried to come up with like a, a sculptural way to display them. But it was the, and his painting is very vulgar and, um, and, so he, and he's very kind of open to uh, context to exhibit his work. And some painters are kind of more precious uh, about um, context for their work. And there are very few painters who come to us with proposals. Um, and uh, we'll talk about some more of them. Um, again, this is an artist named Artemio from Mexico City. Um, uh, a project that kind of is in conversation uh, with Camrose in terms of a negotiation of aesthetics and politics. Um, William Levitt, who is an artist um, who I was just speaking about, um, a kind of really, many of you might know him, but um, really a kind of in the 70s, a really influential figure in terms of um, experimental music and performance. And um, he recently had a MOCA exhibition um, 
that Ann Goldstein produced before kind of MOCA went off the reservation. But um, he produced a site-specific installation. He also found a script, uh, an unrealized script from the 70s that uh, we co-produced with him. And he's somebody who uh, we're really turning to as kind of a father figure who was really part of a legacy of lost nonprofits in Los Angeles, um, LACE and LICA, and uh, spaces that have uh, disappeared or kind of just not uh, functioning at a, a rigorous uh, level um, to date. Um, an artist named Gustavo Artigas uh, was someone that we always thought about, an artist from Mexico City, who we always thought about in terms of the kinds of um, actions that he was able to do internationally. And I always thought about him um, in relationship to like the limitations of what one can do in institutions in the US and how we were going to be a flexible entity to provide um, a scenario akin to like lawlessness <laughs> in other parts of the world. And um, apparently we found ourselves having limitations. He wanted to take um, like a, a bulldozer and basically take our ceiling down. And then we realized we don't own the building and we're not able to do that. So he basically had to uh, create this kind of uh, impulse for destruction in terms of more of a provocation. So he kind of called artists and architects, like what building would you want to destroy in the context of L LA? And then it was voted upon and then we had to lobby with the city to try to destroy Disney Concert Hall, which is what architects want um, to destroy in Los Angeles. Um, so it was sort of a failed experiment. So um, we, um, the kind of flexibility that we desired, we still um, are kind of uh, limited uh, in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of what we do, um, we're really focused on a very dense community of emerging artists in Los Angeles, Nicole Miller. So we give a lot of artists it really is one of those moments where maybe I'm a bit nostalgic for what I had at Artist Space, which doesn't always exist anymore, which was freedom to give young curators and young artists the ability to show work that maybe out of school is not totally ripe or ready for consumption, but like open to a space that's raw like ours for like conversation or failure. And um, so we have a project space and that's really how it, it, it functions. So this was a new video by Nicole Miller called The Conductor. And um, I think it ended up at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And um, really an amazing collaboration between an actor and the artist as a, a kind of conductor, a kind of choreographer or director of movement with no sound. So just these very uh, aggressive sp facial expressions where um, it's really a kind of beautiful but uh, abstracted relationship between um, the subject and the viewer. Um, one of the most I guess it's funny because it seemed like a risk at the time, but now the market has kind of consumed this work, <laughs> absorbed it. Um, kind of Wally Beshti came to us with a proposal um, at a particular moment in his career, and it was kind of creating a mirrored floor that kind of when you walked on it, um, it broke and uh, it fractured, and it was beautiful and um, it really, those type of things like the Ruben Ochoa situation, Wally Beshi situation, it's one of those things where I had a board, I just wouldn't tell them what we were doing, you know, like we, you know, we had liability insurance, but it was a moment where, you know, my governance committee is a little bit more hardcore now, but, um, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, German tourists who would take their shoes off until they bled and, um, and so now I think this, um, literally, I mean, I, nothing, I mean, it's, that happened. And um, so I guess this has been restaged in other Kunsthalles and even commercial galleries. And, um, uh, but it was a really interesting moment for us because every time an artist comes with a proposal, it's really about like what one can and can't do and to try to realize a proposal according to an artist's vision and taking as much risk as, um, as possible um, without 
closing the doors today. Um, a lot of interest um, and the artists who come to us with proposals is to kind of get outside of our site and so we use warehouses and, and other sites of opportunity. Uh, this is a artist's uh, kind of studio space in a warehouse downtown that Sarah Kane, who's an artist who had just moved from San Francisco to LA and has now become uh, an a LA artist who is very supported, um, just producing site-specific work in these other lease sites. Um, Artists who I used to work with when they were young and didn't have galleries like Kelly Walker and Wade Guyton sometimes come to us to kind of do an experiment before they try it out in a larger institutional context. So their kind of collaborative project where they were making these new silk screening paintings and they were kind of doing it on the architecture and they made paintings and hung them on the streets and they were stolen and hung them on our building and really were kind of using and playing with um, our interest in working in the public domain. So it's interesting, I mean, so many spaces use the rhetoric of kind of experimentation in laboratory, but artists do come to us to kind of uh, test ideas early on. How are we doing for time? Because I'm going very slowly. This is still like 2007, so I'm getting worried. <laughs> We're okay. Adria Julia, who's an artist from Spain who found himself in LA um, at Cal Arts, who kind of uses LA as a hub and travels internationally, is an artist. One thing that we like to do is work with artists over time in a variety of contexts. And we started with commissioning um, a film um, called um, A Means of Passing the Time. And he found these USO performers, these actors, and made um, a 35 millimeter film. And it was this really hyperly theatrical black and white film where these actors um, kind of blown up and really close up um, to the viewer were kind of performing these vignettes as they would on a very loud army base. And it was, um, it was really kind of disturbing and problematic and because they were enacting these stereotypes in order to kind of get a character um, relayed to the audience in this very chaotic context. Um, and the film was quite beautiful and, he, and we brought it to Lyon for a biennial and he's somebody um, that we're kind of trying to uh, commission uh, new projects with and um, as the opportunity arises. Michael Queenlin, um, who, you know, a lot of what happened, I mean, I had come from New York, and so a lot of artists who I worked with in New York and loved and respected um, had never shown in LA, or someone like Michael Queenlin uh, went to UCLA, and that's where we met, and then went to New York, so kind of bringing work back um, to a community um, of artists who supported him. He basically restaged his Brooklyn Railroad apartment in the gallery space. And what was amazing is he has a particular sensibility and so there were thousands of artifacts in the apartment and it was really this conflation of like personal domestic objects and his sculpture. There was really a kind of collapse between the two. Um, early on there really was um, an impulse on the part of artists to create site-specific monumental sculpture in our space. And then that got incredibly monotonous and like what you expected when you would walk in every eight weeks, like you would see a monument. And so we had to think about that. So we called Tom Lawson. And Tom, at the time, had no gallery and was someone who was really interesting, who's like the father of, you know, um, you know, a kind of critic on contemporary painting, but like nobody would touch his painting. Um, and it is painting that's incredibly problematic and very political and incredibly vulgar. So obviously I have an attraction to a vulgar painting. But um, we took this series of paintings um, called History Painting. And it was a series of portraits that had to do with the Iraq roar and a series of map paintings about like global transformation. And Tom Crow and Tom kind of stage a conversation about the problematics of painting and the, I guess it was still the 20th century. Um, and this was the exhibition. And then, so I think what 
is maybe more interesting at times for our curatorial team is to work with um, a different generation of artists that maybe than is expected of us. So there really is a kind of intergenerationality to the program, um, you know, working with Mary Kelly or Charles Gaines or William Levitt or Daniel Martinez or Tom Lawson, Meg Cranston. So there is this climate of, uh, you know, mentor mentees that come out of the density of art schools, and that really kind of reverberates over time throughout the logic of the program. Um, it's not staged literally, but if you're looking, um, it's there. And Mary Weatherford, again, a painter whose heyday was like making, you know, feminist 80s massive paintings in New York, who kind of disappeared and came to LA, um, she also said, I would put my paintings in your space. And she started making sculptural paintings. She added neon. Um, to the work. Um, they're kind of abstractions which are um, kind of stem from early landscape paintings, but um, she got a residency in Bakersfield and this residency of um, kind of driving through the city and kind of investigating the history and politics and economics of every city, every street in Bakersfield, kind of appropriating neon, looking at the signage, looking at the history of neon in a city like Los Angeles, which she says predates Paris. Um, she really unearthed this kind of regional history and created a series of paintings, which has then um, really made me open to this medium in our kind of really raw space. Um, sometimes artists, like even someone like Mark Bradford, will say, I want to make a billboard, or um, he was working on a new technique, kind of shifting between kind of additive and subtractive methodologies, and started um, taking paper and billboard and signage um, from the urban landscape, and started sanding um, his paintings and he actually wanted to bring the material that he got in the street back to the street. So he produced um, this site-specific painting at our entrance and then he added the sound element. Um, it was a Nina Simone song, Mississippi Goddamn, so it was like his first sound <laughs> installation. So, And he was hilarious because um, we had been working in a way with artists that it was so much about like we want to Get, you know, I worked at artist space and like there weren't even preparators there and there weren't artist fees and like you had to drop off your own work and so it was all about like that's not okay and kind of like creating scenarios where you could you know give more resources to artists and so he walked in and he just did everything himself and like we have a team he was like that's what not what nonprofits are for and it was the only experience like that we've ever had <laughs> um, so he has a kind of special role. Um, he's like an ambassador of LAX art. Um, this was the most problematic public art project we've ever worked on. Jedediah Caesar, who is known for his studio practice collecting debris um, from his studio space and then um, casting it in resin and cutting it into kind of formal shapes, um, kind of had repeated this process time and again, commercial galleries and museums, and kind of that's what he was known for, and he's recently broken away from that. But he wanted to take, make a monument and put it in an unspectacular um, site um, in Los Angeles, not in a plaza. And this is in Culver City, in a kind of intersection between uh, residence and kind of commercial sector. And so um, it was placed in, we had a kind of gathering to acknowledge that this thing had been cited in this kind of anti-site. And then I got a call two weeks later that a neighbor had complained that trash had been left on the street and that sanitation was called and it was at a local dump. So our major public art project that took us two years to produce, so I told Edie, mommy has a public art emergency, and I called the artist and told him that his sculpture was at the dump. And so Cultural Affairs then got it back, and it um, you know, had really been um, mistreated. And <coughs> luckily, part of his practice is kind of, he was quite flexible, and we still have a lot of work to do in staging discussions about the problems of public art, and we want to make, he wants to kind of 
he needs time to address what happened, but um, he cut it up as he does, and the sculpture has, has had many lives since then. But um, This project with Carrie Tribe um, is a good example of uh, a project like the Shannon Ebner project when the Hammer and LAX Art came together. And we staged a project um, in relationship to what they had at the Hammer as an invitational. So Carrie had a major um, installation at the Hammer and LAXR and then staged this performance um, at both sites. And it was a restaging of the Hollis Frampton uh, 1971 film, Critical Mass. And if, do you guys want to see some of it? Let's see. I'm not that handy. Well, let's see if I can do this. This computer's so old, I don't. Let's see. It's not. Let me see. Just bear with me for a second. I'm like the only curator who does not know how to embed video in PowerPoint. Okay, let's see if this will open. This computer is really old school. We should donate new computers to Locus. I don't think it's gonna open. Um, but 
what we're finding is now these type of durational performances that artists are coming to us with and the density of audiences that are coming that can no longer sit in our alley <laughs> or in our space. So now we're really relying on uh, the Getty Theater and the Hammer Theater and Red Cat Theater. So Eleanor Anton comes to us and says, I want to restage a play that I did in the kitchen at in 1972. And so we did it at the Hammer Theater. And so we're kind of, um, you know, really uh, kind of lucky to have so many partners, but really um, kind of reliant on... Uh, Site. So it's also something that we're considering. Charlie White, um, another USC professor, someone who kind of evaporated into academia, came to us with a proposal, and that scared me because um, I thought people would think I'm an anti-feminist. And it was a project called Casting Call, and he converted the space into a casting agency and put out a call that was very problematic for a very particular type of... California blonde girl at a really strange, you know, tweeny age. And he was casting that girl um, for the billboard on La Cienega. So what you see is literally a Hollywood casting agency who's kind of occupied the gallery space and this kind of glass vitrine created in the audience. Uh, watching this happen, like stage moms, and it was... I was, I mean, I, I had to take a couple of Valium because I thought I'd be fired for sure. And then this girl, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of girls uh, came through. And um, this is the girl who was selected for the billboard. And um, I still don't know what I think of the project. Um, so Matt Lips, um, sometimes artists don't come to us with an exhibition project, but just a billboard project, and sometimes it's just a test to see if uh, you know their studio work translates in the public realm, and it usually doesn't, but sometimes we let them. Um, this uh, was uh, curated by our um, a curator, Aaron Moschietti, who is now at Red Cat, who helped found LAX Art um, with the collective Caraballo Farman, uh, really speaking to uh, the spectacularization of grieving in light of uh, kind of media uh, archival imagery that they collected from the Iran and Iraq war. Um, the current exhibitions right now are, are Alex Israel, an LA artist who actually worked with Charlie, um, who I've known. My best friend was his babysitter, and apparently then he ended up at Yale as an artist and was supposed to go see his video, and then got him into graduate school, and now he's sort of like this baby superstar, and it's weird. But um, he had this model in his studio as an undergrad, and it was this kind of Oldenburgian monument to LA. It was a sunglass lens. And so we, I always said, when you graduated, let's cite this. And it cost millions of dollars to engineer this thing. So we ended up um, making a kind of gallery scaled version um, for this lens. And there's also a concurrent billboard project up on Sunset Boulevard, but I think I didn't put the image up. And then Meg Cranston, who's someone, um, again, a kind of really influential figure to a younger generation of artists in LA, who shows um, all over Europe and really most of the work, if you really think about you know, where you saw her work, it was in Berlin or New York and really not in Los Angeles. And so we invited her to this Made in LA biennial at the Hammer and um, she did one thing, but it, it wasn't really a kind of open uh, platform. So we said we would give over her, the space to her. She was going to do a retrospective of her videos. Um, she lost the box, so that didn't happen. Um, and um, she basically said she'd been working on this concept of color theory and how, like, art historically, she was invested in looking at color theory over time and then how it translates into popular culture. And she created paintings like You Won't Like 
this painting now, but you will in 2017, and really looking at kind of um, the projection of uh, color as dictated by uh, Pantone and how it kind of seeps into every field and in the public imaginary from fashion to design. And so she was going to create, the proposal was really like this density of collage and this all over floor installation in the color of 2013, which is this emerald green. And in the end, she kind of created this monochrome. She turned the space into like this emerald green monochrome. And there is this really vulgar painting of, um, of uh, Kate who uh, wore an emerald green dress and uh, it kind of made emerald even more uh, kind of popular. And it's, it's Meg at her most minimal moment. And now, okay. Um, really quickly, we have a new curator, uh, Matthew Shum, who really is working with us to kind of internationalize our program. And uh, recently, Jens Hoffman, an old colleague of mine, was involved with the Shanghai Biennial, which was last fall, and um, really tried to kind of deconstruct the whole concept of national and international pavilions by creating a series of pavilions um, based on cities like Detroit, Brooklyn, LA, et cetera. And so uh, LAX Art was asked to represent LA and um, I think that and Waleed. Um, we were given, so we, we invited Waleed Beshti because um, he had been doing research and been working um, on uh, some kind of really focusing on publication, been looking at some um, images in his studio um, research in China that really focused on uh, the logic of counterfeiting. And really, um, he started doing writing on uh, kind of uh, kind of a post-colonial look at uh, kind of capitalist enterprises and the logic of cultural translation and the co-option of European and American brands and how it's kind of translated and reiterated and counterfeited and like the logic of translation and translation and translation into mistranslation into abstraction. So he appropriated that operation to his own work. And knowing that we were walking into a kind of very uh, problematic infrastructural nightmare as we know all biennials are. Um, and so we kind of came in um, to this to try to help him realize this proposal. And so he really, instead of making work in the studio, tried to create a scenario that like was set up for failure knowing that the system would be flawed when we arrived. And so um, the logic of counterfeiting kind of centered around this uh, Celine bag that is like this iconic Celine bag that is like copied and copied and copied. So we got off the plane and went to the marketplace and bought every different typology. He has like an archive of this kind of Celine bag. And all of them are kind of like mistranslations of the next one. So he really started fetishizing like the material, the language, um, and created, um, so basically this label, you know, uh, kind of in the market would be taken off and it would be Celine. So it's kind of a, a camouflaging. Um, and so he wanted to leave all these artifacts. So he kind of put these objects in conversation with older photographs that maybe you've seen before. Um, and then um, these photographs um, of an Iraq embassy were originally shown at the hammer and then he shows them elsewhere and he kind of will cut a, a, a hole, like a, a hole puncher in the negative and that will be further abstracted and it kind of, they kind of really morph um, over time and in various uh, scenarios. So he um, gave the files over to kind of a Photoshop um, uh, entity in Shanghai and told them to fix the photographs. So when we got there, we didn't know what they would look like. So um, they were just kind of uh, abstracted versions of Wally Beshti's. And he did that kind of operation a few times over in different scenarios. So he took the language and the iconography, the logo of the biennial, and he would put it through translation software, like between English, and, um, and then it would um, 
kind of be reiterated and kind of go back on Google Translation until it was just like an abstracted, uh, kind of absurdist uh, mess. And he did that as well with all of the iconography and all of the articles about um, logotypes and brands and, and commerce. And so that also went through these dynamics. It was a newspaper that the audience could take away through these devices of, of translation and mistranslation. And then he also sent over all of Wally Beshi's catalogs to printers. And, um, and so they were kind of misprinted and then like a lot of his images became obliterated. So kind of handing, um, handing his own work over to the logic of the copy. Um, and this came on the heels of, I won't go into it um, in depth, but the Made in LA exhibition. This is a Rye Rockland installation. And basically the experiment was like, there were two um, disparate impulses. One was LAX art impulses to use other sites throughout the city. Like, um, I don't know if some of you from um, who are from LA or been to LA, there's this incredible art center at Barnstall Art Park and um, on the east side. And it really is a site where families go and there are parks and artists go um, to take classes. But it really has become more of like a community center rather than like really having a rigorous uh, gallery program and so the building is kind of problematic and but it's super raw and I was really interested in the site and um, so Barnsdall became one of the sites for the Biennial so it was the Hammer LAX Art and Barnsdall and we really were going to start accepting proposals for public art projects and things throughout the city but the Hammer's impulse was really about driving audiences to the museum so there was really this kind of conflict between like audiences elsewhere and that there are other audiences besides art audiences and then that kind of museum um, demand uh, for numbers. Um, and so some of the artists, um, this is a kind of Liz Glenn installation, a new commission um, that was staged at the Hammer based on some research that she had done about um, smuggling tunnels. Um, the the Gaza border and she kind of recreated all of these objects in lead uh, that you can touch um, which uh, were, was really pushing the museum that you could there were these drawers of objects that audiences could handle and she really pushes against the museum and so it uh, really was the most kind of interactive uh, installation they've ever had with um, with objects, which was interesting for her. So it was really about these objects, like, um, you know, a particular, like, olive tree or a wedding dress or certain biscuits or chocolates or drugs or cigarettes um, that were, like, all of the number one objects that would be smuggled in this context that were remade. Um, and then our site was kind of taken over by Slanguage, an artist collective really led by um, Carla Diaz and Mario Ibarra Jr. And so they collaborate with artists and musicians and they, um, in Wilmington, California, where Mario's from, there's a studio that's really um, focused on education and focused on um, children and arts education. And so they basically took over our space and uh, created a series of residencies and workshops and so part of the space was just open to family workshops on a daily weekly basis and um, and then a kind of retro a 10 year retrospective of their work um, inside the space. Simone Forti was one of the artists who um, did a series of new works at Barnsdall LAX Art and the Hammer shown here in the context of Maine and LA. Um, I should probably move on. Are you bored yet? No. Um, Vishal Judego is a really interesting artist. Again, another artist, uh, kind of Indian-born, Canadian uh, schools, and then came to UCLA uh, to work with uh, Mary Kelly in Los Angeles. And he's somebody who we work with over time and commission new work whenever we can. So this was his first solo exhibition in Los Angeles, and he worked closely with Aram on this. Um, and 
he basically works with actors, oftentimes um, people that he's close with, his partner, and now he's hiring actors as well. And he creates scripts that are just handed to them and a kind of spontaneous, absurdist film is created. And there are very um, kind of interesting kind of surrealist objects that are props that are kind of staged in conversation with the video. And so for Made in LA, what we tried to do was take 10 proposals and newly commissioned work as anchors and then we build the exhibition around that. So Vish was one of those proposals and it was to um, go to Mumbai where he's never made work um, to create a new film. And the film really uh, was kind of an experiment for him. It had a different uh, kind of weight, different sense of politics in terms of place, in terms of his own subjectivity. Um, there was a seriousness to it, working with actors, and so for him it was really kind of getting him out of his context and um, working kind of internationally for the first time in a place that is his home, but not his home. And um, it really, the humor of his work that's so characteristic of his work kind of was lost in this uh, otherly uh, scenario. And this was the installation that was staged at the Hammer and how props kind of, um, kind of are reiterated in the gallery space that you also find um, in the context of the film. And so eight years later, and thinking about what it is we do, I kind of went back to think about the first talk I gave about LAXR and like what our intentions were. And it goes back to what I said before when we were talking about Gustavo. Like this is a piece I kind of, when I was an academic, I wrote about certain artists and every article or chapter I wrote I staged as an exhibition. And I was doing a lot of work in South Africa at the time. And I was looking at early Kendall Gears uh, work. Like this is the Market Theater. Um, you know, 1995, you know, a year after the election and a kind of a performance of a brick, you know, is thrown through the window of, um, of the gallery space. And so thinking about that and thinking of like early Robin Rhodes before his commercial work, <laughs> evolved and the kinds of like political provocations, the kinds of performances that are staged in kind of institutional buildings in Cape Town. And one of Gustavo Ortigas, going back to him um, at, uh, in Mexico City, like hiring this motorcyclist to basically uh, bust through, the stuntman to bust through um, a wall in the museum. And also Gustavo, uh, they're in kind of a uh, historical museum in Panama in the context of a biennial, like setting it on fire um, in a faux way. And kind of thinking about the kinds of projects I was interested in and kind of looking at them today and the kind of lack <laughs> in terms of our original intentions and maybe kind of regrouping and getting back to those original intentions at this point in time. And what we're doing is we put a uh, kind of international curatorial team together and we're launching this new platform which is based on international residencies and new commissions um, and we are using sites throughout the city. And it, right now the working title is called The Occasional and so now we're really focused on travel and proposals. So we, I just got back from Israel and how are we doing for time? Okay, well maybe I won't go in um, to these projects, but basically there are uh, two artists that we're commissioning new films with uh, Nir Evron and um, Nir Pareg. And so they will be brought to LA and they'll be kind of our first artists in residence and they'll kind of assess sites and do research and, and make new work. And it will be the first work that they'll make outside of the context of um, Israel. And um, so that is basically the next five years and what the curators have figured out about the occasional thus far is that even though the platform will be um, monumental for us in terms of commissions and research and travel, um, that there are a few principles. Like there's no spectacular kind of 
opening moments that uh, the curators want um, the projects to kind of culminate in some type of end point and that the projects um, are not bound to kind of institutional time, like they'll happen in the time that they need to happen. Um, like the only parameters that I have are budgetary, like they can happen when the money is there. Um, but um, that we're kind of flexible in terms of time, like there's no set opening that this has to happen in 2015. So we're starting to work now, we're starting to kind of gather proposals, we're working on an idea, a framework that all of the curators are going to respond to that will kind of come into contact and contradiction. And, um, and um, what else? And also one guiding principle is that even though it is very project driven and very kind of commission centric is one idea that we're trying to take all of the research and the curatorial process and find ways aside from the logic of conversation or publication, like how to make the curatorial process transparent and what devices can you use. Um, and I know it's a kind of a principle that curators and biennials have have used, but it's, it's usually kind of um, never executed. So that is um, something that we are, are taking up right now. So keeping that in mind, I guess um, if anybody has any questions, um, I will open it up and thank you for entertaining. This is like nonprofit therapy up here, trying to kind of hash out where we are. So thank you.